Isn't this fabulous that it's the 250th birthday party for uh, uh, Thomas Muir? So happy birthday, Thomas Muir, you know. It's, uh, and the other wonderful thing is that you people have heard of him, which nobody had until just a short time ago. Um, I mean, for a man who was actually internationally known in his time and celebrated uh, right up until the time of the Chartists in the 1840s, uh, he was seen as a symbol of uh, resistance, as a symbol of sacrifice, and then just suddenly dropped out of history, became a little footnote in history books. And uh, in the 20th century, there were oh, a couple of wee books about him, but not all of them were very sympathetic either. There were some of them trying to do him down quite badly. Um, and, and just the fact that People are interested again. I think it's uh, it, it's absolutely uh, fantastic. I I when I started researching uh, this book uh, in 2008, people would of course say, "Oh, you're writing a book. What are you writing about?" And I say, "Thomas Muir," and they go, "Who's he?" You know, that nobody had heard of Thomas Muir. I hadn't really heard of Thomas Muir until I found him in a footnote uh, in, in, in a history book and thought, well, wait a minute, this is a fabulous story and, uh, and, and an important story and it needs to be told. Um, funnily enough, just last week I found this old pamphlet. Um, it was written by a man called William Stewart and it was published by the Independent Labour Party in 1908. Now just think back to 1908, I know you're not all that old, but, <laughs> but think about 1908, 1908. 1908 is a period of revolutionary change, not just in Europe, but in Asia and in South America uh, at, at, the, at the same time. In this country, the old politics were being challenged. The Liberal Party was about to die a death. It was about to commit suicide. It was being challenged by organized labor. It was being challenged by women who demanded the vote. It was being challenged by the Irish who wanted out from under colonial dependence. But they didn't get it. They just didn't get it at all. And were sent into the dustbin of history for uh, a long, 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 long time. Um, at the same time, the Tories didn't get it, but the Tories did their usual thing. They said, aye, we know how to sort this. Repression, more repression, more, more and more repression and legislation against all this, this, this kind of stuff. But that's just to give you an idea that politics was right in the front of people's minds in 1908. It was a very, very, very political time. And in this little book called Fighters for Freedom, William Stewart, his very first chapter is about Thomas Muir. It's only about six or seven pages about Thomas Muir. But he says in there, he said, when I speak to socialists about Thomas Muir, none of, most of them have never, ever heard of him. Some of them can recognize just something of a bit of a tradition, but they're not really certain uh, what, what it was. So even at the beginning of the 20th century, and these people are 100 years nearer the radical period than, 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 than we are, um, at the beginning of the 20th century, he had actually begun to be forgotten. Possibly it was because the politics of the radicals, which was for a change in the franchise, which was for representation in the House of Commons, was just not sufficient by then. Industrialization had really taken its toll, huge economic and social changes, and by that time you have political organizations with social and economic programs as well as simple political programs for uh, uh, representation in Parliament. But even so, it's very strange that, uh, that they should be forgotten just quite so, so uh, uh, totally. Um, in the process of, of, of the research that I was doing for the book, I came across a small organization of like-minded people uh, based in Bishop Briggs, which is where Muir's family uh, home of Hunter's Hill uh, was based. The house is still there uh, in, in, in Bishop Briggs. Um, this was an organization called the Friends of Thomas Muir, organized by the Watson family, by John and his sons, uh, 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 Jimmy and, and, and Alex. Uh, it had been going 
for just a short time. Um, and they were very keen to have Muir's story uh, out in the, in, in the world as well. Um, in fact, just the will to actually do these things is not enough. And it takes a bit of hard work. And they were not short of, uh, of, of, of the effort. Um, they brought about the first Bishop Briggs Thomas Muir Art and uh, Music Festival in 2011. And there has been one every year uh, since. They are uh, the, the major movers behind quite a lot of the events uh, the, uh, this week uh, and, and into uh, uh, the October um, uh, for the celebration of the 250th anniversary. They also went along to Eastern. They didn't st stop there. They went along to Eastern Bartonshire Council, explained to all these councillors the importance of this man, this reformer. Um, and for that, they secured backing uh, for the, the Thomas Muir Festival uh, in Bishop Briggs. And not only that, but they've got an official heritage trail from Bishop Briggs to Milton of Campsie with proper signposts uh, all the way along, all funded, funded by the council. But of course, the recognition that's now beginning to happen of uh, uh, the, the name of Thomas Muir and his compatriots in the, in the, in the radical movement is much more than about a small local campaign and a wee book. It's something much bigger than that. It's a sea change in politics in Scotland. It's that, 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 that fizz and dazzle of the, 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 uh, the debate during the, uh, the, the referendum campaign not only awakened a sleeping electorate, but brought thousands upon thousands of young people into the idea that politics can be about hope, it can be about the desire to have a better future, uh, the, the, the desire to make things better for the next generation and not make things worse uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as is happening at the moment. And it's at times like that that people then look to precedents and say, well, who's gone before and who, you know, wh who are they, these people? You know, why, why, why don't we know about this guy? We've just heard his name and uh, uh, what, what, what's going on here? Um, and of course, Thomas Muir and the Radicals of the 1790s is an ideal little piece of that jigsaw to, 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 to drop in to that thirst for knowledge that, uh, that, 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 that people are beginning to have at the moment. Now, for those of you who don't know, Thomas Muir, 26 years old, led the grassroots movement that blossomed all over Scotland in the summer and autumn of uh, 1792, just in a kind of similar way that the, the, the referendum debate just went whoosh and blossomed right across the, the, the country. The reformers organised conventions here in Edinburgh, which requested, and I use that word uh, deliberately, they requested in petitions to Parliament universal manhood suffrage, equal electoral districts, and annual elections. They were actually consciously loyal and law-abiding at the time. But the government of William Pitt and his Home Secretary, the Scottish MP and political fixer, Henry Dundas, were so alarmed at the threat to the aristocratic control of Parliament, especially the aristocratic control of the House of Commons through placement uh, of, of, of MPs uh, and, and pensions and privilege and little crown uh, 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 subventions. Um, they were so alarmed at all of this that in just four years, they used the might of the state to crush this political mind. In 1796, the friends of the people had been crushed. In the process, they falsely charged Muir and four of the other leaders of the movement with sedition. Um, now, I, I was doing a little uh, uh, thing with Gavin the other day there uh, for, for broadcast up at the Martyrs Memorial uh, in Colton Cemetery. And these three guys uh, were there watching us, uh, three, uh, uh, what do you call them? Steeplejacks, three steeplejacks. And they were quite interested because they thought, oh, it must be one of our guys that put that up there. And, um, and they, they were really interested and they had never heard the story before and we're talking to them later. And then one guy said to me, he said, I don't want to appear ignorant, he said, but what is sedition? And I thought, oh, I should have explained it. I should have said what sedition is. And of course, it is using language and actions calculated to overthrow the government. It's a charge just one down from treason. 
The government would have used the law of treason if they thought they could get away with it, but they thought they could only press a charge of treason against these leaders. The trials were conducted here in Edinburgh by the old hanging judge, Lord Braxfield, and he was aided by a picked jury. He picked the jury. There are 45 names given to him, and he picks 15 out of it. Uh, and not only did he know most of these people, but he, they, they, everyone he picked was a member of an anti-reform organization called the Goldsmiths Hall Association. Um, and so he tried and convicted all of these leaders in 1793 and 1794 and had them transported, an unprecedented sentence, transported for 14 years to the newly formed penal colony in Botany Bay. As well as Muir, there was William Skirving, who was a farmer from Fife. He was the national secretary of uh, the, the, the association. There was Thomas Palmer. He was an English Unitarian minister who preached uh, in Dundee. There was Joseph Gerald. He was the uh, son of uh, uh, a West Indies planter part of this whole slavery uh, 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 system. Uh, he was trained as a lawyer in, uh, in, in America um, and was in Edinburgh as a delegate from the London Corresponding Society, one of the major reform organizations uh, in, in, in England uh, at the time. As well as that, there was someone called Maurice Margarot, and he was the son of a, a wine merchant, uh, uh, probably Swiss, maybe French, we don't really know, but he was educated in, in Geneva, and he was the, uh, the chairman of the London Corresponding Society. So these five, the Edinburgh Five, shall we call them, uh, landed at the penal colony in Sydney Cove in October 1794. They were actually Australia's very first political prisoners. Uh, but early in 1976, Muir escaped from Sydney. I mean, some of the narrative you will know, uh, so I'll just briefly go over this. Uh, he managed to hitch a lift on an American fur trader's boat across the Pacific Ocean. He got off at Van what is now Vancouver Island, hitched a lift on, uh, on, on a Spanish boat. The whole of the west coast of America was Spanish at that time. Hitched a lift on a Spanish boat down to Mexico, petitioned the Viceroy to allow him to get round to Philadelphia. He wanted to get to Philadelphia. Um, to safety, but England and Spain had just gone to war again and the Viceroy said, no, nah, sorry, you're a prisoner of war, we're going to put you on a boat and send you back to Spain where the colonial authorities in, uh, in Seville will deal with you. Um, just as the convoy was approaching Cadiz, it was attacked by a squadron of British uh, frigates. There was a, quite a violent sea battle in Connell Bay and in the process, Muir was struck by shrapnel or a ball or, so, or, 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 uh, or splinters or something like that. And he lost uh, his left eye, part of his left cheekbone and lots of flesh and his teeth were, were exposed. And, uh, but he was so famous internationally that he was claimed by the, Spanish co the, the French consul in Cadiz as an honorary citizen of the new young republic uh, uh, of France. And as soon as he was fit enough, by December uh, 1797, uh, when he was well enough to travel, he was taken by coach and given a great state-sponsored hero's welcome in Bordeaux and then in Paris. Um, his injuries were actually so horrific, though, that he only lasted another 13 months and died uh, in, in uh, January uh, 1799. But that final year when he was in Paris, uh, he, along with other Scottish and Irish exiles in, uh, in, in the French capital, were lobbying the French government for political and military support for the independence movement in Scotland and for, uh, sorry, for the independence movement in Ireland and the democratic uh, movement uh, in, in, in Scotland. They didn't really care whether Scotland, they, they were neither unionist nor, 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 nor uh, nationalist. They were Democrats and any way they could wrest power from the corrupt state and give it back to the people of both Scotland and, and, and England and Ireland would, would, would suffice. Um, uh, uh, meantime, in in, back in Scotland, the Friends of the People, they, they had not long survived the forcible disbanding of, of the, 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 there were, 
there were three, actually four, uh, uh, conventions took place here in Edinburgh. The, the, the three Scottish conventions and the last one was called the British Convention. That's the one where the, the, the delegates from England, the, from the English uh, radical societies uh, uh, had come. But it was forcibly broken up. The leaders were arrested. Um, and the Friends of the People didn't really survive for very long uh, after that. But they were succeeded by another organization. Uh, many of the same members were, 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 were in it, and it was called the United Scotsman. And the United Scotsman adopted the secretive constitution, a secretive centralized constitution of the United Irishmen. The relationship between the Scottish and Irish reform movements uh, were close from the very, very beginning in 1792. There was a new United Irishman in Ireland as well, because they too, the reform organization, had been broken up. Its leaders were in exile or in prison, or they had to flee. Uh, and a new secretive organization that by this time was campaigning for Irish independence, not just reform of the Dublin Parliament, uh, came into existence. Their constitution was the one that was adopted by the, the, the United Scotsmen. But like many of the United Scotsmen, Muir in Paris had now kind of recognised the futility of, sort of seeking reform from a corrupt parliament. Um, it was now a self-proclaimed Republican. While they had been in Australia, they had got little bits and pieces of news from letters and from other ships, people in other ships that arrived. And the, 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 the fifth of the Edinburgh Five to arrive was Joseph Gerald, and he arrived in Australia a full year after the other four, and so he could bring them first-hand news, uh, eyewitness report of what's going on. They learned about the government's uh, repression, about its suspension of habeas corpus, that's the right to, to trial if you're, if you're, you're charged, um, and they're also the arrest and trial for treason of the leadership of the English uh, uh, the reform societies. All of these charges, thankfully, were were, were rejected by English juries who weren't picked and packed in the same way as the, 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 the Scottish ones were. Um, but also in Paris, Muir would have learned of uh, riot in Scotland, rebellion in Ireland, mutiny in the Navy uh, in, in England, and the kind of improbability of reform of a corrupt parliament with all of this taking place uh, appears to have changed his mind and he became uh, a, a, a Republican. Uh, through that. There was a whole series of mass arrests uh, in England and Scotland which effectively silenced the new United organisations. They were penetrated with spies and, and, and all sorts. But mass riots in the Scottish lowlands and near insurrection in the highland parts of Perthshire and, and, and Aberdeenshire in 1797 all took place aimed at reversing what was called the Militia Act, and this was a way, a sort of conscription uh, into the army. Uh, and these riots were only put down by the mass influx of, uh, of, of soldiers uh, from England. In Ireland, the May 19, uh, 1798 rising was after the leadership uh, again had been uh, arrested, uh, broken up. Uh, the rising took place nevertheless, but it was leaderless, it was fractured, uh, and the small force that France eventually sent with Wolf Tone, Tone on board was too late and too little. But Muir still persisted in lobbying the French Foreign Minister Charles Talleyrand uh, to send aid to Scotland and more aid to Ireland, because he reckoned that if Ireland continued to be in revolt and Scotland joined in, then the English government would be forced to sue for peace with France. This was the, 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 the kind of thinking behind it. Delegates from Scotland and England were attempting to get to Paris after the mass arrests of the leadership of the United uh, Organisations, uh, or the, the, the mass arrests and the arrests of, of, of the leaders. And in November 1798, Muir left Paris for the little town of Chantier, just north of uh, Paris. He was looking for a place that was 
not penetrated by spies because there's spies everywhere in Paris. You could imagine that, that, that you know all the European governments uh, against the French Republic all had their spies there, and and, and you can just imagine the, the 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 kind of atmosphere in Paris at the time. So Muir went to Chantier to try and set up a safe house, a meeting place for his expected messengers coming from. Uh, uh, Scotland, one of whom was uh, Angus Cameron, who had been the guy who had led the insurrection in uh, uh, in, in in Perthshire and, and Aberdeenshire. He led the insurrection on a big horse and gave orders in the Gaelic, uh, and it really looked for a time as if something uh, uh, m might have been taking place. Anyway, Cameron and another guy were trying to get to Paris, but Muir died in Chantier before any meeting uh, could ever take place. We don't really know uh, if the messengers got there uh, in the end, but Muir's body was found uh, in his lodgings in early in the morning of the 26th of January in 1799. Uh, and we assume, it has generally been assumed, that he died of, of, of his wounds. Um, uh, um, even after the United Scotsmen were broken up, uh, it's kind of likely that big parts of this secret organization still survived uh, to fight another day. Because on the 12th of July, 1799, there was an act passed in, uh, in, in the Westminster Parliament suppressing the United Scotsmen and the United Englishmen by name. There is evidence, though, that there was kind of spasmodic, spasmodic activity around Glasgow and Fife, uh, up until about 1802, but we don't know much more about that until after the French wars end in 1815 and the activity all begins again. The, 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 the public uh, uh, campaigning all begins again. But yeah, it's hard to imagine the scale of the repression uh, ju just at that time. Right from the very start in 1792, the government got the gloves off. Um, if you kind of imagine McCarthyite America in the 1950s, then you multiply that by 10, you'll get some idea of the kind of repression uh, that, that, that was going on in these islands. Tom Paine was forced to flee because he wrote Rights of Man, and for no other reason. He was uh, prosecuted for sedition uh, in his absence. Uh, he, he, he went to France. He became a member of the French uh, na National Convention there. He was elected by Calais to the, the, the convention. But cheap copies of, of, of Payne's book were circulating, even though it was banned. There was 200,000 cop cheap copies, as reckoned, were circulating in these islands uh, by the end of 1793. It was also translated into the Gaelic and read extensively uh, in, in, in the highlands. But the sheer cultural pressure, apart from political pressure, was cultural pressure forced poets like Wordsworth, Coleridge, Keats, Burns, and many, many, many more of them to either recant or deny or disguise their support for liberty and democracy. All of Burns's political poems, the famous ones like Scots were here, a man's a man for all that, you know, everything like that, all the political poems that Burns wrote were written in the, four, the final four years of his life from 1792 to 1796. They were all published either anonymously or with a pseudonym in the radical press in Glasgow or Edinburgh or London. He, it's just hard to imagine now that a man's a man for all that and uh, Scots were hay would have been regarded as seditious. They could have cost Burns his liberty and possibly even uh, his life. Um, the government kept on this offensive all the time. It, 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 supported new, it, it supported newspapers and individual journalists with secret funds from the, from, from, from the, uh, the, the, the Secret Service uh, uh, budget. Um, they planted stories everywhere. This is the kind of spin that you might think spin is new. No, 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 no. It's been going on, been going on for quite a long time. Uh, exaggeration, spies, all that. That's all been going on uh, for, 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 for a long time. Spies and informers and agent provocateurs were infiltrated into all of the, the metropolitan and local organisations uh, from London right up uh, 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 through the, the, the country. And the very name of Jacobin which was the French 
faction who took over uh, uh, during the, the, the terror, that was attached deliberately to every reformer, to every anti-slavery campaign, or, or uh, uh, th those people who weren't toffs like uh, Wilberforce and, and all the rest of it. But all the, there was a huge anti-slavery uh, movement, and the overlap between the radicals and the anti and, and the anti-slavery movement was tremendous. There was a massive anti-war movement. We just don't really get that stuff in your history books. A massive anti-war movement, and again, the, 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 the overlap of membership w w w was significant. But the name Jacobin was given to everybody connected with any of these organizations, you know, and the, the word Jacobin was even more taboo and more toxic than the word communist in McCarthy's America. So that, that this kind of idea of what was going on. Now, the law was also brought down like a sledgehammer uh, but, but by the government. Habeas corpus, as I said, was suspended. Anybody suspected of treasonable practices, uh, fairly undefined, uh, was lifted and locked up without trial, sometimes just for days, but sometimes for months, and sometimes until the, the legislation uh, was repealed. And even more statutes were enacted which banned seditious speeches, even in private conversations in taverns or coffee houses, and forbidding meetings of 50 or more people. We couldn't have had this meeting except by permission of a magistrate, and he had to say whether the meeting was okay uh, uh, or not. And many of these gagging acts, as they were called, actually carried the death penalty. It wasn't just you know a fine and a couple of days in, in, in jail. Some of them carried the, the death penalty. Newgate Prison in London was absolutely chock-a-block with pamphleteers, journalists, editors, and printers. Uh, there were several publishing houses actually started. They began in Newgate Prison in the, in, in the 1790s. So that, that's, what, like, that's why we kind of should remember uh, uh, these people, uh, and they are quite important in the history uh, of, of all the movements that, that, that came later because they were the pioneers, they were the progenitors of, 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 of this. This was the first mass uh, movement for popular democracy uh, in, in these islands. And nowadays, Thomas Muir's not so much reluctant remem remembered as he's just simply forgotten. Um, those radical movements that followed Muir and the, and, and, and the others uh, honoured them, uh, the, the so-called Scottish mar martyrs, you know, as uh, symbols of, of resistance and sacrifice right up until the end of the Chartist movement in the, uh, the, in the late 1840s. And it's after that that they begin to be forgotten. But Things are now changing a little bit. So that, th th there is a renewed interest. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but there is a renewed interest. Um, that, that there's a modern bust. I don't know if any of you have seen a picture of it, but there's, there's a modern bust of, uh, of Muir, uh, a very nice bust. And the plaster cast of it is in the Bishop Briggs Library. And if you're ever passing through Bishop Briggs, there's a little there's the, the, the a little display in a corner to Muir and, and, and the radicals, and this bust is there, which is uh, done by the Scottish uh, sculptor Alexander Stoddup. Interestingly, the bronze of the bust is in the Museum of Democracy in Canberra, in Australia. Australians know more about the, martyr, the Scottish martyrs than Scots do. It's just quite fantastic that we're not taught these things. They're not taught in universities. They're not taught in schools. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the Australians have got this wonderful bust, and we haven't. Uh, um, but th th there's also an older memorial here in Edinburgh to Muir and, and the Martyrs, and it's that great big 90-foot obelisk sticking up uh, down there at the, in, in, in Calton Cemetery. It stands 90 foot up in the, the skyline of, of Edinburgh. Everybody's probably seen it, but very few people know what it is. There's, there's one guy who's written a story of, of, of the, that it was a decade-long fight to get that thing up. It was radicals and chartists uh, from the 1830s right through to the 1840s. The foundation stone was laid in 1840. 
1844, and it was completed in 1845. There were thousands upon thousands of people there for the, the foundation stone, and, and a march from the from Parliament Close, where the trial was, down to uh, d d down to Calton Cemetery. Thousands up on Calton Hill, watching all of uh, watching all of this. Um, uh, but it did take a decade of, uh, of fight and the rump of the Tory council in Edinburgh and nationally the rump of the Tories in, in Parliament fought tooth and nail against it. I mean, they wanted it up right up on the top of Calton Hill. They wanted it up there beside Robert Burns and his friend uh, Dougald Stewart, the philosopher uh, Dougald Stewart. They wanted it up next to... The, you know, the, the, the national monument that's up there that's supposed to be like the Acropolis, you know, uh, but they got the first two or three pillars up and then ran out of money and didn't finish it. That was supposed to be uh, a national memorial to all the Scots who died in the pointless bloody wars against revolutionary France and, and, and Napoleon's regime uh, later. So the radicals wanted it up there because they wanted it really high up above Edinburgh so that everybody would see it and so that it would look down on, in St Andrew's Square, there was a 132-foot column with Henry Dundas uh, on, on the top of it, dressed as a Roman senator. And Henry Dundas is looking down George Street to his pal right at the other end, William Pitt. And in the middle is George IV, the profligate regent, uh, as was. And the, 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 there was one campaigner at the time uh, in a meeting, said that these three statues represented vice surrounded by corruption and greed. <laughs> and, and so they wanted it up on the top of Kelton Hill. Eventually, a compromise was reached, and they said, OK, you can buy a plot in the Kelton Cemetery. Was well, that good enough for the Tories? No, they still put up a legal fight that went on for another 12 months, took it to the High Court. They said, to buy a plot in Calton Cemetery, you have to have a body underneath the monument. Eventually, the High Court in Scotland threw it out and said, this is just rubbish, you know, away and build your, away and build your, uh, your, your monument. So there it is. Uh, it's up there, but uh, hardly anybody really knows uh, uh, what it's about. Um, right, today's the 250th anniversary. Uh, tonight, uh, Alex Salmond is going to deliver the very first inaugural uh, Thomas Muir Memorial Lecture. We hope that this could become an annual event uh, where some public uh, figure will come along and talk on some aspect of democracy or the constitution, but the first one uh, uh, is tonight. And there's lots and lots of other things taking place. Today in Mulgai, the painter Ken Curry is unveiling a new painting called The Trials of Thomas Muir. Um, uh, what else has taken place? The, 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 the friends of Thomas Muir have, uh, have organized lots and lots and lots of little things right to the end of, right to, uh, and some big things, right to the, uh, to, to the end of the year. There's already been uh, 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 an, an exhibition down in the Parliament. There's going to be a democracy walk, something like the one when when the the uh, Martyrs Monument monument was put up in October. But that's going to continue from the monument down to the Scottish Parliament. Um, uh, the, the, tomorrow night, the Faculty of Advocates uh, is, uh, is is staging. Um, uh, uh, well, restaging some parts of, uh, of, of Muir's trial up in, in the High Court, which is very interesting. I just hope that they might find the courage to put Muir back on the role of the Faculty of Advocates now because he was struck off the Faculty of Advocates when, uh, 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 when he was outlawed. Um, and maybe all of this, somehow or another, will uh, combine to restore in our collective memory and the collective memory of the Scottish people a remarkable man and a remarkable movement. They deserve prominence not just in Scottish history, but in British history and also more generally in the history of democracy. And just to finish, some of you probably know uh, a song that was written in 1992 by Adam McNaughton and recorded by Dick Gochin. Dick sings it a lot at his concert still. And it's, it's called Remember Thomas Muir of Hunter's Hill. And the last verse goes... When you're called for jury service, when your name is drawn by lot, when you vote in an election, when you freely voice your thought, 
Don't take these things for granted, for dearly were they bought. Remember Thomas Muir of Hunter's Hill.